Okay, tonight our moderator will introduce the panel members. Um, and the theme tonight is, is uh, witnessing World War II. And the, the lecture, the theme of the whole lecture series is 70 years since World War II. Um, so tonight, the moderator is a famous person unto herself. Um, she and her family came out to Los Alamos in the spring of 1945, and Dorothy McKibben told her family that they would, everything was full up here, and that they would have to stay at a hotel in Albuquerque while her father worked up here. Her father worked for uh, Kistiakowski, um, doing shape lenses, okay? And, um, and her father said, well, no, that wasn't gonna happen. So he bought a tent, and where did they stay? You guys know? Who knows? Bandelier, exactly. So, <laughs> so, so, um, so uh, Ellen Bradbury Reed is our moderator tonight. Uh, we're very pleased to have her. And um, let's see, so she, she had married Norris Bradbury's middle son, John. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we're going to, there's so many wonderful stories. I mean, it's amazing to have a group of people like this who each one, I'm sure, could go on and on. We'll have to be careful of time, so you don't want to be here all night. But uh, we're going to start first. Uh, because it's the beginning with Mary Zemak, who was on Honolulu for Pearl Harbor. Not, maybe you didn't know what was happening, but uh, <laughs> her father, Harold St. John, was chairman of the University of Hawaii's botany department, and one Sunday each month, her father led students and family members on a field trip to the mountains of Oha. So two days after her 11th birthday, on her father's field trip on December 7th, 1941, they observed the Pearl Harbor attack from the Wanahai, how do you say the mountains? Well, okay, a few miles away. <laughs> she graduated from Radliff with a degree in biology and worked in medical research in Boston, Philadelphia, and Berkeley where her husband was a physics professor. They had their three children while in Berkeley and moved to Washington, D.C. in 1970, where she led Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts. And her husband served in the State Department on the SALT negotiations with the Soviet Union. She's now a living treasure, founded the Hamas House Thrift Shop in White Rock, and she has a garden of permaculture demonstration site, which has been featured in several garden books. So um, I will introduce each person. I won't go through them all uh, right now, not that you would forget any of them, I'm sure. But Mary, would you like to tell, since you saw the beginning of it World War II? Right. And, uh, is it on? I don't, it can, is it on? All right, I'll try to speak into it. Uh, we uh, took uh, these field trips. We took these field trips uh, once a month during the school year, and we started early in the morning, picked up some botany students, and drove to a rendezvous point. And then we all went, drove through the pineapple fields up to the edge of the mountains, and parked our cars and got out. As soon as we'd all gotten out of the cars, a shell exploded near us in the pineapple fields, close enough that our little dog and another person's dog ran under the cars in fright. It was that close. Well, what was this going on? We looked around, and there in the direction of Wheeler Field, the military airport, there was an enormous column of smoke. Well, um, you might think that we'd think something was wrong, but that was not the case because the Saturday newspapers had said that the military were gonna have war games on Sunday, the red team would attack the island and the blue team would defend it, civilians please stay out of the way. All right, we saw no flames, we saw no planes being shot down. We did see a number of planes circling around overhead and one by one they were dropped down, let out a single bomb, go up and join them in a circle. But no planes dropped. We saw no flames, and we couldn't see the rising sun on the wingtips because it was too far away. Nobody knew the difference between a Japanese plane and an American plane at that distance. And the grown-ups decided this was maneuvers. 
Um, now, the owner of the second dog was an, a secretary to one of the admirals at Pearl Harbor, and she was going to give him a piece of her mind on Monday morning. <laughs> Somebody could have been hurt. Yeah, well. So anyway, we gathered up our packs and started up into the hills, and we climbed up a little ways until we could see Pearl Harbor. There was more smoke coming from Pearl Harbor, but we saw no flames. Now what was all this? Well, the Standard Oil Company of California had built six, uh, 50 enormous above-ground oil tanks, which was the fuel supply for the entire Pacific fleet, and they were stationed around Pearl Harbor, each one with an earthen berm around it to contain the oil if a leak should develop. Well, if some excited recruit was dumb enough to fire at us, that could have happened at Pearl Harbor, that could have set one of these tanks on fire, and that would account for all the smoke. Uh, now, these adults were not dummies. My father was a World War I veteran from trench warfare in France, and he knew what war was. This couldn't be war. Anyway, <laughs> we couldn't see that the smoke, of course, was the Arizona and other ships in the harbor burning. We could not see the ships sinking. The smoke obscured that. We could, however, see other ships in the harbor with the guns on their decks blinking. They were firing. We saw planes circling overhead. None of them dropped, although one of them did actually land on the Iao later, and there's quite a story about that. Um, so we figured this was more maneuvers, and we still had to climb 2,500 feet to get up the mountain. So off we went. And we were gone all day in the mountains, collecting plants. That was the, the reason for this hike. And when we came down, we were always the last car out. We came down at dusk, got into our car, and my older brother, who'd just gotten his driver's license, was, of course, driving. And we got down to the highway, which was, at that time, a three-lane highway with cars passing in both directions, with cars going in both directions and passing down the middle. Uh, pretty hairy. Uh, my brother, it was just dusk, and my brother turned his headlights on to ease into the traffic. People screamed at us to turn off the lights, and we were quickly pulled over by a policeman. He leaned his head in the car and said, my God, it's Dr. St. John. He was an old botany student who had been on many of these hikes, knew exactly what we were doing, told us about the war and, and so on. He said, I'm supposed to let make civilians spend the night by the side of the road, but since I know who you are and what you're doing, follow me to the Pearl City Police Station, and we will paint out your lights, and maybe you'll be allowed to go into Honolulu tonight. Well, we did, and as soon as we started off, my I always had the front window seat because I was liable to car sickness. My father ordered me into the back seat, told me to lie flat on the, ground, on, the, on the floor of the car. It was clear to me that he thought that we were in danger of sniper gunfire, and he was putting me on the floor to save my life. Well, this did not make me feel very comfortable. Um, it was the most frightening part of the entire war for me. Uh, well, my brother and I changed seats very quickly because cars in those days had no headrests or seat belts. And I lay down on the floor, which was also uncomfortable because the 1936 Nash had the drive shaft going right down the middle of the floor. <laughs> and the dog walked all over me and tried to lick my face. But uh, the, the students pulled her up on the, on the seat and off we went. I did not feel at all safe. What I figured was if there was sniper gunfire, the grown-ups would be picked off one at a time, the car would crash, explode, and I would be burned alive before I could get out of the car. But I knew I had to shut up and not distract the driver, so there I was. We did make it to the Pearl City Police Station without an accident, and they painted out our lights with navy blue. They'd run out of black, and they had no paint brushes, but they had a rolled up newspaper and managed to swab the paint on, and we were allowed to start into Honolulu. Uh, it was, an, again, an overcast sky, um, but we could see what was going on. But when you get into Honolulu, those of you who have been there know that most of the streets are lined with flowering shade trees that arch over and would cut out any light from the sky. So once in a while, my father would have to turn, blink on his lights so he could see where the road turned. Every time, people screamed at us to turn off our lights. Well, normally we'd, of course, driven the students to their homes. This time we let them off at the corner nearest their homes and they walked home in the dark. And we drove back home and we pulled up 
onto the gravel driveway beside our house, my mother rushed out, poked her head in the car to count heads and said, Harold, there's a Navy wife in the basement with a loaded revolver, please take it away from her. <laughs> she also told us there were 21 women and children in the basement. Uh, they had come around in the afternoon and uh, assigned my father as block warden, but of course he wasn't there, so she had to be block warden until he came. And her duties were to go around and tell everyone in the block where to turn off their water and their gas in case of a bombing attack and to keep everyone calm uh -huh, and <laughs> make sure no lights were showing at night. Everyone could black out rooms and so on. She blacked out enough rooms. She blacked out our basement and that's where the 21 women and children were. She had blacked out the kitchen so she had fed them all dinner and uh, she fed us and then she led me to the bathroom and said that I should take a bath and get ready for bed. And I said, it's not possible to take a bath and brush my teeth in total darkness. She said, you better learn very fast. <laughs> and she was not at all sympathetic. But I managed somehow. And, um, but then going downstairs, a big slumber party. 21 people and most of our playmates were there. And <laughs> my parents and my brothers slept upstairs. But father did extract the gun from the, from the woman. She was going to kill the first Japanese that burst in through the windows. See, no, nobody knew if we had been invaded as well as bombed. Uh, nobody knew what was going on. All right. Well, it, uh, immediately uh, afterwards, the, the schools were all closed immediately. All the teachers were used as census takers. They wanted to register everybody in the territory. And so we were all fingerprinted, blood typed, given tetanus and typhoid shots, and soon after that, we were all issued gas masks. We were talking, people were really afraid of you know, what might happen. Um, so uh, my father was one of the census takers, and he reported, he, he had a, an area near the university where there were a lot of pig farmers, and he reported going into one house and we sit, sat down at the, t at the table, and the entire family burst into tears well, what was the problem? Well, the parents, of course, were Japanese aliens. The children were citizens having been born in the territory, except for one little boy that had been born on a visit back to Japan. And my father had to register this little child as an enemy alien. And it was, that was what was causing them all the grief. At that time, the, uh, our immigration laws were such that people from the Orient could never become naturalized citizens. Those laws, of course, have been changed, as you know. Uh, anyway, wartime in Honolulu was an interesting affair. Um, my mother started a school uh, for uh, four of us and um, the local children, and their mothers were school teachers. Of course, anything they came up with had very little to do with the ordinary curriculum, except maybe for mathematics. But uh, it kept us busy. And eventually, the schools reopened. Schools were then all honeycombed with air raid trenches. And for air raid drills, we would run out into the yard, and we were supposed to jump into the trench unless it had standing water in it, which was fairly often. Uh, but in the case of a real attack, we would have to go in. My father asked my sister to describe what happened during an air raid drill. She said they'd go out and get down in the trenches. And she said, we're told to put our heads down and cover our eyes so that the pilots cannot see the whites of our eyes. My father roared with laughter and he said, no, but they'll see the row of little white panties on all those upturned bottoms. <laughs> was, we all wore very short dresses. And, you know, uh, anyway, uh, we, we had some adventures all right. Uh, the next year, I went to junior high school um, at, at where I wore shoes to school for the first time then. Once a week, we wore shoes. Um, and soon afterwards, people, the children were asked to help in the pineapple fields as laborers. On the mainland, I know some children harvested crops, various kinds, but the pineapple fields needed a great deal of work. And I uh, did that for uh, several years. And that was very hard work, working all day out in the hot sun in the fields. Um, we got paid very little. 12-year-old girls got 21 cents an hour. 
which is not a princely sum even in those days. I got more babysitting than that. Anyway, we did survive that. And uh, we had a lot of servicemen come through the islands, of course, you know, on their way out to the battle stations. All ships stopped in Hawaii, all planes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And any serviceman who was coming through, whose parents knew that he might be headed that direction, would try to find out the name of someone in Hawaii that they could make contact with. And the phone would ring, and it, you don't know me, but uh, and the best one we ever got was the son of a friend of a parishioner of a minister that my grandmother knew. <laughs> well, we'd love to meet you when you come out to dinner. Yes, pause. My two buddies are standing right at my side. You know, <laughs> well, bring them along. And we entertained a great many of them on the way out, saw some of them on the way back. And my mother deliberately once took me to the military hospital, to the mental ward, to see one of these returning soldiers who had shell shock. She said, I want you to see that there can be mental wounds as well as physical wounds from warfare. It was made very clear. Um, all right. No, I thought uh, because if you have questions, it would be better to ask Mary questions now instead of waiting till everyone speaks because you might forget your question. So we could take a few questions now and uh, see if any, I'm sure you do. Also, I will tell you that I, for the benefit of my children and grandchildren a number of years ago, I wrote up a story of December 7th and also another one on working in the pineapple fields. I have a few extra copies, but if people would like to have it sent by email, you need to give me your email address and we can forward them to you. Can you say a few words about December 8th? About what? what? December 8th. What happened in Hawaii on December 8th? Oh, December 8th, yes. Well, uh, of course, military law was established, and most men were not around because anyone in the service, of course, was called to active duty, both active and retired. People who, uh, and all other men, for several days, were called out either to help with the wounded, that is doctors, dentists, veterinarians, psychiatrists, etc., cetera, uh, and any other able-bodied men were called out to dig graves and uh, donate blood. So there are only the women and children left at home. Well, then it was martial law, and you were to stay at home, and uh, we, we didn't know what was going on. Another question? Here we go. Could you tell us if any of the uh, men who were associated with the families in your basement lost their lives that day? No, no, no one uh, in our block, uh, none of the military uh, people uh, lost their lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more, anybody else? Okay. Um, Thank you, wow. This is gonna be so fabulous. <laughs> and um, next we have Chick. Bergstein and Joe Bergstein. And I don't know, do one of you want to go first? Uh, because Joe was in the Army Signal Corps in 1941, went to the Philippines and was captured on Bataan on April 9th, 1942. He went on the Bataan Death March and was liberated in 45. He later earned a BS in physics and math from Washington and Lee and an AMS from Vanderbilt and has worked at Los Alamos, so. That's Joe. Oh, I feel like Joe. <laughs> um, I actually didn't see much of the war. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a loss. Uh, well, uh, I'll say one thing. It's, there's some difference, I think, in going off to a war that's actually in progress 
for being there in peacetime and having a war fall all over you. Uh, the uh, Actually, the Philippines were not bombed until nine hours after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Uh, so it's kind of amazing and a reflection on Douglas MacArthur that our Air Force was caught on the ground nine hours after Pearl Harbor and essentially destroyed. Uh, not that they would have changed the outcome in that region but it wouldn't have been quite a shock to, quite the shock to morale that it was. Um, actually, the Philippines had been occupied by the American Army since 1898. Uh, somebody asked me why the Army was there. And, and it wasn't a nice thing because uh, the Filipinos wanted to be independent from the very beginning. And people high up in our government thought that, were convinced that they simply weren't ready for it. That they needed our civilizing uh, influence. And so we, so our troops uh, uh, gave them a water cure, filled them full of water and jumped on their bellies and things like that. Of course, I didn't see that, I read about that. And when I said I didn't see much of World War II, but I did read a lot about it afterward. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, MacArthur, let me back up a minute. The strategy for the Philippines in case of a Japanese attack was that uh, the troops should withdraw into this Bataan Peninsula and, and the island fortresses, there were four island forts, the largest of which was Corregidor, it was uh, about a mile and a half long and a, at its, and a half mile wide at its widest. Uh, there were three other small forts in Manila Bay, which had very large artillery for repelling uh, warships coming in, into Manila Bay. Uh, Unfortunately, they didn't have tops on the batteries there, on these gun batteries. And the Japanese were, the bombers, the Japanese bombers were very good uh, at that stage of the war. They generally hit what they aimed at. Um, so, uh, I was actually, uh, on the day that the war started, I was, uh, with a platoon with 35 of us uh, down on the southeastern end of Luzon. We had gone there by inter island freighter and we had set up a, a rudimentary radar uh, detector. Uh, it um, wasn't very good. Two planes flew over us while we were there and we didn't pick up either of them. I, <laughs> I think it was a question of resolution. I think we, we would have picked up 150 planes, but not a single plane. <laughs> uh, the first plane was actually an American uh, B-17 that flew over us to see if we could pick it up. Uh, the second plane, uh, we all assumed was a Japanese plane because he went right over our heads and around the edge of the mountain there and dived toward the ground and we heard machine gun fire. And, and then he appeared again where we could see him and then another uh, glide and more machine gun fire. And, uh, and he strafed and set afire a uh, shipload of dynamite. The dynamite was there for gold mines that were in that area. Uh, now, we all assumed it was a Japanese plane because he strafed an American ship, but it was a long-nosed plane. And I didn't realize till years later, 40 years later, that wasn't a Japanese plane. The Japanese didn't have any planes like that. That was an American plane because 
Japanese ships had landed about 30 kilometers south of us at a place called Legaspi a few days earlier. And I, th I believe that this plane was sent from the Manila area to check, out, check it out, see what was there. And I think he missed his target by 30 kilometers and, and strafed that ship and set it on fire. Anyway, uh, there were, as I said, there were 35 of us, one platoon, and our lieutenant decided then that it was time that we should leave. And we had these four trucks that carried all this gear. Uh, and there was, we had a, a Gulf gasoline map that showed the road back to the Manila area, a couple hundred miles away, as being partially graded. But partially graded as a matter of definition. Uh, uh, actually, it's mostly just a trail through jungle, and occasionally a hundred foot uh, length of, of uh, graded road. And I, I think that it was let out in hundred foot sections to individual Filipino groups to do, and some did and some didn't. <laughs> anyway, we had to blow up these trucks and leave on foot. And uh, we had brought some, taken some canned food from the gold mine warehouse with us and made strange stuff. We, uh, four of us decided whatever we had, because there were no labels on the can, whatever we had we were gonna split and, and make a meal out of. So we had, I think, orange juice and sardines and two other things that all went together, but it was nourishing. You know? and <clears throat> anyway, when we finally got out through there to civilization, sort of civilization, little tiny barriers, uh, we, we uh, commandeered a school bus. And uh, turned out the bus didn't, the brakes were defective on the bus. It was a very mountainous country. In small barriers, the Filipinos had set up little roadblocks like you see in old FBI pictures, you know, where you had to go through like that. And there'd be Filipinos with shotguns there, and they would be yelling, halt, you know. And, and we couldn't stop. We'd yell out to witness, U.S. Army, U.S. Army. And I'm going to cut this short. Anyway, we got back. Uh, there was a new lieutenant back at our Fort, Fort McKinley there, at our headquarters there. And, First, he told us not to get out of the trucks because they were having a, they were cleaning out the barracks. You know, troops were cleaning out the barracks. Well, uh, we really didn't pay any attention to that because we were in rags. Uh, and I, I was a good soldier, and I knew that there was a post exchange half a mile away, and I didn't have a toothbrush. I had nothing, and I wanted to get a toothbrush. So, being a good soldier, I asked permission to get down to the PX and get a toothbrush. And this lieutenant, who was an idiot, asked the first sergeant what he thought about it. And the first, first sergeant said, well, sir, we let him go the all want to go. So I couldn't go. Anyway, that evening, we loaded on the trucks. And we went into, down into the dock area of Manila. And we loaded them on an inter-island ship, a small ship. And we thought maybe we were heading for Australia. But we just went across the bay to Bataan. And actually, we had a collision with another ship. And I was standing on the deck, and this I could see the ship approaching us. A ship can't turn sharply, you know. If he tries to turn to avoid a collision, his rear end swings around this, this great collision, this great mass of sparks, you know, and the railing crashed in, and part of the deck crashed in, you know. Anyway, we got to Bataan, and uh, I had, I had uh, kind of mistakenly picked up a pair of rubber boots back at that mine warehouse. And I didn't have a chance to take them off for seven days. So when we got onto Bataan, we had to march. We had to hike up to our position, which was going to be further north. And when I had a chance to pull those boots off, the bottom half of my feet came off with them. So there was a hospital there, a field hospital. So they let me go into that. And uh, uh, the medics <laughs> sat me there on a chair and put a dish of purple stuff. I don't know whether it was potassium permanganate or Okay, anyway, this is a cure-all. So I was sit, 
sitting there and, and the air raid warning went off and everybody ran away and, and the bombs fell all over the hospital and I couldn't leave so I was just sitting there in a chair. Uh, but then, you know, they healed up in about a week and I went on and found, found the company further up. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to cut this short here. Uh, on the, uh, there, there was heavy fighting during January, early part of February, then it quieted down. Everybody had malaria, the Japanese had malaria and dysentery. It was a, it was a pit for malaria. So everything slowed down. The Japanese then reorganized, brought in new troops and at the end of March, by the way, early in March, Douglas MacArthur left and, and went to Australia against his wishes. He wanted to resign his generalship and become a private in, a, in an infantry company, but we knew better than that. Anyway, uh, so uh, at the end of March and early April, the Japanese really attacked a lot of artillery and a lot of, a lot of bombing, a lot of planes. My job there was um, repairing wire communication lines that were torn up by shell fire and bombing. So. Because we didn't repair them while the shells were hitting in the area, but, but when the shelling stopped, we repaired them. Uh, but a couple of days, well, I, I think about April 7th, we, the surrender took place April 9th. Actually, the Japanese didn't allow us to surrender. They didn't accept the surrender. They, they told that General King to have his men lay down their arms, and, but it wasn't a, wasn't a formal surrender because he couldn't surrender the island forts to him. So uh, you, know, you took your chances. But anyway, uh, I had a squad of uh, eight men. Uh, we, we joined up with a group of about 50 other men that uh, were headed by a captain and uh, got rid of souvenirs, any Japanese souvenirs that we had. I hoped everybody did. Somebody didn't, uh, and and we managed to. Uh, we went to the road right there, this main north south road, and uh, a Japanese officer came by and, and accepted our our surrender there. Now, what we while we were standing there, um, a Japanese mountain artillery company came by, or battery came by wild-looking little horses jerking along these little little three-inch guns in uh, mountain artillery. And the troops running along, you know, some of them holding on to the horses' tails. And one of them, as I can see as he came toward us, uh, he, he was kind of yelling and he was all red in the face and he, and he fell down on his face right in front of us. He was sick. I think he had malaria. And, and the Japanese behind him jumped down on him and hit him across the face a bunch of times and jerked him up by his pack straps and ran him on. And I sort of figured we weren't going to be treated real, real nicely either after that. Anyway, um, a, a, a Japanese, um, well, this Japanese officer came around with a can of food and he had a Filipino interpreter with him and a little tiny spoon and we each had to take a little bit of this food. And the Filipino interpreter said, you must eat with them. It is their custom. And well, I put it in my mouth, but I didn't swallow it. Uh, I spit it out first chance I had. Uh, but everybody else ate it, I think. It was all right. Anyway, one Japanese saw the, my, a string that I had my dog tags hanging from. He jerked the dog tags out, and he was yelling at me, sorry. He wanted to know what they were. I don't know. He was yelling, Nanda, or something. And I didn't know any Japanese. So I said, dog tags, identification, name. And, and he was jerking at him, so I just ducked, ducked my head and let him take them. Anyway, uh, then that march started in groups of 100. Uh, there, there was, you know, somewhere between, I think, about 93% of the people that made the march survived it, so it wasn't what you'd call a proper death march. But, uh, but, but it was horrible, and there was a lot of gratuitous cruelty. Uh, we had, 
Hadn't had any water, we marched for a week, six, seven days. No water, no food. They had a, a lot of these uh, wells, deep wells that were under pressure, I forget what they're called. Anyway, and the water was piped along on, in bamboo pipes. And uh, many of these joints in the bamboo, the water was just pouring out on the ground. And they stopped us across the road from all this nice fresh water. And a couple of guys tried to go over and fill their canteens. They shot them. Uh, anybody that fell out that couldn't walk any further was shot or bayoneted. Or, uh, trucks would come by and try to knock people off the edge of the column. It was a good idea not to be on the edge of the column. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we stopped for the night and people would die. A lot of people were killed on the road and people would die. And, and the stents in these stopping places was horrible. The dysentery was, was horrible. Uh, finally, we got to a little town where there was a uh, San Fernando Botanica. There. there were several San Fernandos in the Philippines. Anyway, there was a railroad there, but they put us in this enclosure there. There was a, a building and there was an outside enclosure. And the next day we were going to take this train. And I checked the building and it was horrible. Dead people, stench. Outside was just as bad, but I preferred outside. Anyway, next day they put us on these little, little metal boxcars. Kept us sitting in that hot sun for a couple of hours. Uh, there was only room to stand up. If you died, you couldn't fall. Uh, anyway, they took us some miles up the road to uh, a town that was near our first prison camp. And I did okay on the train. But when I hit that fresh air, it was too much for me. I passed that. I came to lying under a tree in this very large Filipino with a bunch of other people that the same thing happened. And there was this very large Filipino woman supervising a bunch of Filipino kids and yelling orders, you know, and screaming at the Japanese and bringing us soda pop bottles full of coffee and things like that, banana leaves with rice in them. And she actually made the Japanese bring trucks up to take us to the six miles to the camp, to Camp O'Donnell. The Camp O'Donnell, we always had to stand in the sun, take everything out, and pile whatever little belongings we had. I didn't have anything. And then this little Japanese camp commander got up on his table, you know, and he screamed at us, and, you are my enemies, you were always my enemies, you always will be my enemy. And, so we knew things weren't going to be very nice there, and they weren't. Anyway, 1,300 people died in that first camp in the first six weeks. They moved us to another camp, Cabana Tuan, where it took uh, three months to kill 1,300 people. Uh, eventually, th things got a little better. Actually, around Christmas of, of 1942, Red Cross packages came in, and we just got half of a half of a 10-pound Red Cross package, which had protein in it. People, we, our feet would swell up, what we called beriberi. It was an edema from lack of uh, protein. Your body ate your own muscle, and then your tissues just retained water. And that would extend up your legs. And if, and if you just lay there, it would, it would compress your heart, and you'd die. Uh, we slept in barracks, uh, what they call Nipah huts, on split bamboo, which is horrible. And I've seen bed sores that were probably eight or nine inches by five inches, big oval things, horrible things. Uh, I want to tell you one story I think is a little humorous, and I should quit really soon. Anyway, <laughs> we had, a, we had a, an officer of Russian extraction by his name, Captain Ushakov. This was his third war. He had been in World War I in the Russian army and captured by the Austrians. He had been in the uh, uh, Red, White, Red Russian, White Russian Wars in Russia, captured, I forget which he was, but he was captured by the other side, made a prisoner. Here was his third war and he's a prisoner. And he was not a happy camper. 
Anyway, this, uh, they counted us off at least twice a day. And every barracks leader, he was our barracks leader, had to turn in the count. Well, somebody was at the latrine. Captain Ushikov turned in the count, it was one short. An American general gathered him up and took him to the Japanese, and the Japanese checked it, one man short. I don't know why they'd worry about one skeleton, you know, uh, being short. But anyway, they came and counted it. By this time, the guy's back, at the, back from the latrine. And the general, American general, tells Captain Ushikov, he says, God damn it, Ushikov, you Air Corps officers are all alike. And, and Ushikov says, sir, I am field artillery attached to Air Corps. He says, well, anyway, you can't count. Sir, I am certified public accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, so my time in, in the camps was spent on work details. I was a slave laborer. And that means you're, you're worse than nothing. The Japanese believed that anybody would have, who would allow himself to be captured was contemptuous. And he was disgraced to his family and everything else. So, so that's how we were treated. So, uh, that's right. Uh, so another, no, 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 but there are questions. See if we can get this one here. Um, so, Joe, you were in Japan for almost the entire course no, no, from no. being captured. No, I worked in the Philippines until uh, three weeks before the Leyte landings. So, I worked on airfields in the Philippines until October of 1944. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. And then you were shipped over to Japan for the final portion? Uh, yeah, we were put on ships. Uh, we didn't make it to Japan on the first ship. Uh, all the ships to Japan were called hell ships because that's what they were. Mm -hmm. They packed us into holds standing up. Chest to back. There was no room to sit down. Uh, we, we made room. Some of us climbed up the side of the ship. There were longitudinal planks and tied our, I tied my blanket to it, make sort of a hammock. But it wasn't a hammock, it didn't swing free, so your hip was pressed against the side there. But anyway, it made room, people could sit down, people died. There was room for people to sit down, but you sat with your knees drawn up under your chest. Those were hell ships. It took us 38 days. Uh, some of the ships in our convoy were sunk by submarines. Uh, they actually finally ran into Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, the 14th U.S. Air Force bombed at us. Uh, and we stayed there a couple weeks. Then finally, we were able to run over to what well, was Taiwan now, but was with Formosa then. Stayed on Formosa for a couple of months. And in January of 45, another ship to Japan. And miraculously, that ship was not a bad ship. Anyway, we... we uh, Worked at a copper mine up in north in the mountains in northern Japan. Uh, we have another question. Joe, do you know how many of your eight-man squad survived uh, the war? Uh, I was the only one. What? Well, it helped to be small. Yeah. If nobody's getting enough to eat, then the smaller guys are going to fare better with, with not enough food. Uh, well, I had other reasons, other incentives. What was I had never had sex. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what, what was your last day as a prisoner of war when you were rescued by the end of the war? What, what was about it? it? What, was your last what, day? Oh. what, what you happened? Started. What happened at the camp when you were all rescued? And what uh, day was that? Okay, that was August 15th on that side of the International Dateline. Uh, we had gone to work in the morning, and the guards brought us back at noontime. It was something we never did because 
we had our rice and our mess kits with us. But we had heard uh, that PA systems in town, they're broadcasting, and kept, we didn't, couldn't understand what they were saying, but we heard Bini Juku, which is B-29, and Makata, which is MacArthur. And uh, so when, when they brought us back, to, oh, we managed to get a hold of a Japanese newspaper. And uh, six of us by that time were working in an electric motor repair shop. So we got a Japanese newspaper and we brought it back to camp. And there was an Australian colonel with us. There were, there were 44 Australian officers with us. And he was able to sort of decode Japanese writing. And after a while, we gave it to him. And after a while, he came and told us that uh, war was the bloody war was over. He said that what the, the headline had said was that Prime Minister Attlee, whom we'd never heard of, had announced to the British Empire that the world was now at peace. And so, and then we saw that the guards were gone, except for the camp commander, who told us that he was staying there to protect us from the civilian population. Uh, a few days later, uh, planes found us and uh, dropped lots of food, lots of food, and clothes, and uh, that answer it, Nancy? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and yeah. <laughs> This is an amazing night, isn't it? So this is his brother, Chick Bergstrom, who, Bergstein, dropped out of high school to join the CCC, then joined the army in March of 42, and entered the European theater as a part of the 6th Armored Division. So that's the other war. I'll tell you what, he's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Anyway, I went in in 42. Is that better? Yeah. I can't hear it, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, anyway, I went in and we trained in Louisiana and we trained in the desert in California. And then we went over to England in um, 44 and we landed in D Day was June 6, everybody knows it but me, of uh, 44, but we didn't go in until about July 28th. And, we, and I thought we went on Utah, uh, Omaha Beach, but we went on Utah, because I just read it, I read it up on it. And uh, in my first jaunt in combat, I was uh, a gunner and, uh, and radio operator for the, for the company commander. In the first battle we got into, we got into a hedgerow, and my com company commander got shot. We were throwing hand grenades out the door. And even though we were in hedgerow country, we were the first tank to get out. I mean, and that's almost an impossibility, but we managed to do it. And we got out of there, and he wasn't hurt that bad. He had to go to the hospital for about a month, but he came back. And then we went, uh, we had a, a trip down through, we were going down towards uh, Brest, which was a submarine port. And we made a record 100 miles or 150 miles, I don't know. I, I'd have to look it up. But anyway, we got down there and we thought we were going to go in and take it and we found out, hell, they had 10 times more troops than we did. So they decided that's not a good deal, so they relieved us and took us somewhere else. And then <clears throat> we, we kind of fought off and on. And one of the main things in our fighting was, I, by the way, I was in a tank outfit. We were always seemed to like in a chess match because we were always seemed to be under artillery fire. <clears throat> and, and it looks like after they would shoot for a while, we would move maybe 30 feet or 60 feet, and where we left, there would be an explosion. And, and so, like I said, it was truly like a check, chess match. And, and this went on quite a bit during the war, and you kind of got used to it. <clears throat> but one of the things you didn't get used to, they decided to change, was they were going to make the war kind of like a labor union. They're going to give you a week on combat duty and a week off. Well, I'll tell you what, that doesn't work too good. <laughs> that week off was fine, but you didn't want to go back. <laughs> you know, and, I mean, that, 
wasn't too good. Anyway, like I said, I don't want to berate a point. We went, uh, when, I'm sorry. We, we ended up uh, in, I think it was Christmas Day, we had to go to uh, Bastogne because of uh, a, an attack by the Germans, a, a massive attack. But anyway, we traveled all night in the snow. We went up there. And it, actually, it was pretty bad, but uh, you know, it was like the rest of the war, you know. I mean, uh, we survived it. And, uh, and then I came home. But like, when I came home, I never felt like I was in the Army because my brother's tales were always better than mine. <laughs> and, 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 not that, and not that I objected. <laughs> that, that didn't bother me. But another thing about the war that I remembered was uh, a cartoonist called Bill Malden. Now, I, during the war, I had seen some of his uh, cartoons. But after the war, uh, I saw, of course, his book. And, I, and actually, I incorporated that to where it was part of the war, you know, and I got to thinking, hell, did that actually happen to me, or was that Malden's cartoon? <laughs> you know? So I always thought that was pretty neat. But anyway, Joe exposed me to, to Malden after I got home. He gave, gave me the book, in fact. I think he did. But anyway, that's about it, and that's all I got to say. <laughs> So, Uncle Chick, when you were traveling all that distance, were you in a tank oh, yeah. traveling? Okay, so you didn't have to march or walk in the snow. Well, well <clears throat> there was, I'm sorry, there was, one <laughs> there was one occasion where they made us uh, uh, be infantry because of a uh, uh, shortage of infantry, and this, this was in, in Germany. And in fact, I got uh, into a German foxhole and I got vice, and I had to uh, get devoused. Not only, that sounds terrible, but what I did also is I developed hives. And I'll tell you what, they gave me an adrenaline and that cleared up the hives right away. And, and of course they fumigated me, so that got rid of the, <laughs> that got rid of the, the vice. And so I was back in my outfit within a couple of days. But anyway. Uh, Chick, your armored battalion was not Patton's, is that correct? It was. It was Patton's. Yeah. Unit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, while you were in Bastogne and in the Battle of Wald, people back home, like me, I was a, a, a teenager at the time, you'd be reading the newspapers. And uh, as, I re as I remember, or think I remember, uh, it was a very uh, a fierce battle, which uh, the Americans came very close to catastrophe. Oh, absolutely. And uh, at some point, um, the German commander uh, called, communicated with the American commander, I think it was General McAuliffe. McAuliffe. And uh, he called on him to surrender. And according to the newspaper, McAuliffe said, nuts. Correct. I was, all, I was always wondering, what did Rick Olive really say? <laughs> I, I wasn't there. So. <laughs> did you or your parents have any idea what was going on with Joe at any point? Uh, or at, when did you find out what was going on with Joe? Um, I, I, don't th I don't think my parents ever did find out. In fact, I had a sister, an older sister, that, uh, in fact, right when the war ended, I got a telegram from her, from her and her husband, telling me that we're proud of you and we miss you. And that, that, that was all I heard of anybody. Uh, and look, you know, that's the way life was. Oh, and you? Yes. Yeah, right. That you were that you were a prisoner of war. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one more question. How many um, of your battalion uh, survived? 
Actually, from my battalion, most of them survived. I, we probably had about uh, 10 people killed. There, there was pro there was probably about ten people of my battalion that was there, that was killed during the war. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, and our last of this amazing group of speakers is Mia McLeod, who was born in the Netherlands. And her father was a school principal, her mother was a teacher, and they had in her notes a happy life until 1940 when the Germans invaded. Her father was a political prisoner for a year, and the family barely survived. So, Mia, do you want to tell your story? So you can see, is this the right? Yeah. Um, he made a map for me so you can see what exactly happened in the Netherlands. Um, first of all, I have to, the government in the Netherlands, you can put me down for a minute. Uh, the, the government in the Netherlands announced in May of 1940 that they had stored enough food for the whole population of the Netherlands for five years. Uh, that includes, of course, the uh, harvest that the farmers in the Netherlands would have, and uh, the meat production, and so on and so forth. That was the first item that I want you to keep in mind because of the rest of the story. On May 9th, about 8 o'clock in the evening, the German government gave the Dutch government reassurance that the Dutch would be um, considered to be neutral and they would respect that neutrality. However, at two o'clock in the morning on the 10th of May, the German invasion started. It's only a few hours later, six hours. Um, the Netherlands is very narrow. You can see from here to here, takes you two hours by car if you don't run across a traffic jam. <laughs> um, so you can see it's a small country, and it took the Germans five days to get across it, and that was by bombing Rotterdam. They said to the Dutch government, if you do not accept defeat, we are going to bomb all the Little black circles are all big cities. We're going to bomb all of them until you will surrender. But the government had had five days, and they moved all the Dutch treasure onto the, into the Navy ships. The Queen and her family went on the with the Navy, and um, the Golden State Carriage also went with the Navy to England. That was the beginning of the war. Oh, this is the this is a German and Dutch border. Border, uh, our hometown was about there. Yeah. This is all below sea level. Yeah. This. And um, there are three rivers here that I want you to keep in mind. Um, the news that comes from France, right here. Then there is the Waal, which you've never heard of probably. Um, but it's a big river, just as big as the Meuse and the, and the Rhine. And then here is the Rhine. Okay, the, um, this part was liberated first in 1944. 
this part is what I want to talk you, to you about. Um, the Dutch government, of course, with that threat of bombing all the big cities in, in the western part of the country, surrendered. And um, now I go on to 1944. We had had occupation, which was not too bad the first two years, but after that it was horrible. It got worse and worse and worse. In August 1944, one evening over the BBC, the Queen ordered all the trains to be stopped in the Netherlands. They were not allowed to go anywhere. All the train personnel was to disappear. Overnight, there was not one train personnel that was either left alive if they were a traitor, because they were killed by the other people, and the others that were good patriots all had hiding places. And not a train ran again for the rest of the war. The, the next day, there was a big tank column that came up from this part where that was the allies, our allies came up here and went to these two bridges and took them and went across those two rivers. And that part of the country then was liberated. However, they never got to the third bridge because it was to be taken by parachutists that were dropped on this area here. But the Allies didn't know that in Arnhem at that time, there was a big division of Panthers, um, you know, the German tank divisions, and they were there for rest and relaxation. And they didn't get any re rest and relaxation. Um, the parachutists were dropped, and they were like sitting ducks. They were just shot out the air. There were 18,000 of them that were killed that day, and there's a big cemetery near Arnhem where Dutch families have adopted every grave of every Allied soldier that was killed that day. Several of them, of course, with such a dense group of people dropping down with parachutes, uh, there were a few survivors and they were helped as much as possible by the Dutch underground. They came to a house, people took them in. But when darkness fell, they needed to get across the Rhine because if they got across the Rhine here, then this part was already liberated and they could uh, be free. Some of them tried to swim across, some of them drowned. The underground had little boats that they took to these people across the Rhine as much as possible. And then the battle was lost. We could hear the guns where I was, and we knew what was going on, uh, that there was a big battle, but we hoped that the Allies would win, but they didn't. And so that winter started. Um, the Germans said, no trains, no food. What they had done, that remember that all that food that was stored, they had taken all of that and taken it to the Eastern Front. So there was no food stored at all in the country. And he said, no trains, no food. We can't bring import food. We are not going to feed anybody. So they announced that they were going to have uh, kitchens, a kitchen where you would feed 5,000 people. And first we started on those. Um, you could cut, you had a coupon. You go for each person for, with a coupon to the kitchen. And for each coupon, you got one scoop of food. And that had to do you for the 24 hours. Well, nobody could live on that. The first, the first few evenings, it, the food was tolerable. Not very good, but tolerable. But then it deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated until finally it was colored water with maybe some leaves floating in it and maybe some potato peels or some carrot peels. And if you look maybe with a microscope, you might see a smidgen of meat somewhere. But um, you would starve if you had to live on that. Very scoopful for each person. 
They also had the creed that anybody found with food that was not provided by the kitchen was obviously somebody who had been going out to try to steal food, steal food, and was going to be shot on the spot by their, um, by the people that uh, were um, the, around, the, how do you call that? A, uh, yeah, well, you, you'd see a, a sergeant with some soldiers uh, around, you know, that, that would stop you. Um, my father was in terrible shape because he was skin and bones. He couldn't even lie on a, a comfortable mattress because there was no fat, no muscle, no nothing left. And the doctor said he had to have milk. Skim milk, one tablespoon that was diluted half and half with water every half hour. That was all his stomach could take when he came back. And so one of the ways I got some milk for him was to go to a family um, where the husband had been picked up in a razia. I don't know if you know what a razia is. That is a, um, an occasion where the whole village was surrounded by um, the SS, and then they'd come in and they'd pick up every male between 16 and 45, 55, something like that, and send them all to a German slave labor camp, and you, hopefully you, they'd come back. But what happened there is they were not given any blankets, they were not given any shelter, they were hardly given any food, they had to sleep in the, ov in the open, and they, many of them died from disease and hunger. So um, she had two small children and a farm and some cows. And I made a deal with her and I said, look, uh, if I milk the cows, I didn't know how, but if I milk your cows, will you give me a bottle of milk every day for my dad? And she knew my dad because he was the principal of the school and you know all the people knew him. Um, she said, fine. We'll do that. Well, it was amazing how fast I learned how to milk a cow because <laughs> I didn't want to lose my dad. And I brought it home and he gained on that diet 14 pounds in one week. And the next two weeks was seven pounds each. It was amazing. Then after that to slow down. But he told me he was never ever warm again after being in that, in that prison. So anyway, um, one day I went off to beg for food. I actually went to farmers and begged for maybe some potatoes or maybe some carrots or if, do you have an egg maybe that I can have and help my mother and my, my little sister so they don't starve to death. And sometimes you got something and you try to hide it and uh, get home with it. But one time a farmer said, yeah, I just pulled a bunch of potatoes out of the field. Would you like some? Oh boy, that was like having gold or platinum in your hands, you know. And he gave me a small bag full with potatoes and I tied it on my bicycle. My bicycle had wooden tires, by the way, because you couldn't get the rubber tires. And off I went and I met this patrol on the way home. I saw them in the distance. I untied the rope that tied the bag on, and I dropped the bag. And I tried to go on, and the sergeant said, halt, means stop. So, oh my, I've had it, I just about passed out. And he said to me, Fräulein, sie haben es was verloren. That means, young lady, you lost something. Let me please put it tight on the, on your luggage carrier again. And he went and picked it up and he tied it on. Obviously, he was not a Nazi and he didn't agree with the way we were treated. And he said, he patted me on the back and he said, now you go home and feed your family. <laughs> and I, you know, not all Germans were bad. I just want to assure you, there were a lot of bad ones, but not all of them were bad. Anyway, in our town, it wasn't that bad because all the farmers that were there knew us. And so what we got when they slaughtered was um, oh, kidneys and brains 
and tripe and things like that. They wouldn't eat. Or when they had a new calf, we got the first milk if the calf was dead born. And that's, you know, it's very rich stuff. Um, and so sometimes we weren't very hungry and sometimes we didn't. But in the big cities, it was a lot worse because there were food kitchens. Well, it, they fed them actually water. And, and people, mothers and fathers would take a carriage, a baby carriage, or they'd take a little wagon, or they'd take anything that they could carry food in, and they walked um, to beg for food everywhere. I've seen them. You know, the shoes were worn out. They were wrapped in, in rags. They were so skinny. I knew they weren't going to be able to get home again. And they couldn't find food because the Germans took their rations on everything. They wouldn't leave anything in the country. That was our punishment for the trains not rolling. No coal, no electricity, no oil, no gas. Um, to be able to let my mother cook, one of the things I did, uh, I lived in the eastern part of the country and there are some trees. In the western part of the country there weren't very many trees. But the Germans had mowed a forest that was about that high stumps. And I didn't know how to use an axe, but my brother was hiding out because he was 16 with, um, with a falsified identity card that said he was 14, but he didn't look it. And if there was a razia, he would have been taken. Uh, he stayed with a farm in a farm that was, had a wide heather field around it. And they could always see if somebody was coming that you didn't want to deal with. And the farm son was his own, was my brother's age, and the two of them would disappear whenever they saw um, army or SS coming. And so they stayed there safely. But I was the oldest child then. I dig up these roots and took the ax that was in the shed. My father obviously couldn't do anything. And I tried to cut those up, but I didn't have any wedges. And so it was a case of trying to lift that root up all the way and then slamming it down on a piece of oak that we had. And I generally got them apart, but I've been told by people here at X-rays that I damaged my spine because doing that. But we, that meant my mother c could cook something when we did have something to eat, that, which was very nice, because I didn't want to eat raw liver and raw heart and tripe and stuff like that. Um, so that was one problem. But in the cities, people didn't have all those things either. They didn't have coal, and it was a very cold winter with lots and lots of snow. And some people started taking their houses inside apart, all the parts that they could burn, they would burn in the, in the stove to get a little bit of warmth so they wouldn't freeze to death. They were so hungry that, like I said, many of them went out all over the country to get some food. And sometimes a person would say uh, to his wife, oh, I go run an errand and would never come back because he'd collapsed and died in the street. And that happened to quite a few people. To, so it got so bad that they had to send carts around to pick these bodies up. It was what we call in the Netherlands the hunger winter. It was terrible. Well, finally, what happened was the Allies found out about it. And um, they started dropping food in the western part of the country because there were all the big cities. The Germans shot the people that tried to pick it up. And they picked up the food and sent it to the Eastern Front. And then they said, all the farmers, if you had four cows, you had to hand in one for the army. And if you had six cows, you had to send one in for every three cows. So you had uh, six cows, two of them were gone, four. Then the next time they said, one of every two, you have to hand in. And the farmers got so mad, they started slaughtering their cows because they didn't want to do, want to do that. And they stole all the food that the farmers grew. The, they were really cruel. So um, 
Then the underground was in contact with, the B, with, the, with England and told them that the Germans were shooting people for trying to get that food. So what happened was that the German ambassador, I mean the Dutch, uh, not the Dutch, the uh, American ambassador in Sweden called on the German ambassador and said, we want this to stop. You have to give that food to the civilian population because that's what it's supposed to be for. And um, the German ambassador said, what do you think you're going to do about that? And the American ambassador said, you will find out tonight. And that night was when Dresden was bombed. And people have asked me over and over again, why did Dresden get bombed so severely? It was to save about five million lives in the Netherlands that were going to be dying before they could come and, and rescue us. So then the American ambassador went back to the, uh, to the German ambassador and said, um, are you going to stop this or are you going to give this food to the population? Well, what are you going to do? He, then the American ambassador said, Nuremberg is on the, on the list next. If you don't stop this, we are going to bomb Nuremberg to smithereens tonight, just like we did Dresden last night. <gasps> I have to talk to Berlin about that. And Berlin said, no, we can't have that, because he told them, as long as you shoot people for getting food, there will be one city per night that will be destroyed totally. There won't be survivors. And then they said, yes, we will see that the people get that food. And fortunately, um, it was not a lot because, you know, you can't drop as much enough food for that many people. One of the other things uh, during that horrible winter, the bakers had figured out a way of giving us some bread. There was no wheat, but there were flower bulbs. And so they ground that up and made bread out of it. Well, bulbs grow beautifully in sea clay. It's, it's wonderful soil for tulip bulbs. That's why we've got so many hyacinths and tulips and all those kind of things. They ground all that up and they made bread out of it. If you've ever seen bread that smells like clay, that tastes like clay, that goes thunk in your stomach, and it stays there all day. You can't digest it. But one thing it did, it killed off your hunger pains. And so people ate it. I, I can't imagine that it would be very healthy for you. But in the meantime, I still got the milk from my father. And there was another farmer that had told us that once a week, I could get a bottle of milk from them. So I, I went and got that. But that was a horrible chore because he had a flock of geese. And if I went to his front door, those geese came all after me. And they were really mean, you know, pecking at you and, and uh, beating on you. with, with their, But it was important to get the food. And so I did. So fortunately, my whole family survived, and my father was rescued by a, uh, an American surgeon. And this is a very happy thing I want to tell you about. Um, yeah, my home is about over there, a little, yeah. And the big cities are all these black, black rings over here that they were threatening to bomb. Um, to England you go from Rotterdam to Plymouth. Uh, it's not very far. Uh, maybe half an hour. And so um, that you
So anyway, my father had surgery right after the war was over, and we were liberated. Oh, I have to tell you about that. Uh, the German occupation left our village. This is a very funny story. The officers were sitting in a huge uh, Mercedes Benz with two plow horses in front <laughs> and some motorcycles tied behind and the troops walked behind them and when they went across the bridge of, of a small river that was there, they blew it up and they couldn't get back. So um, the next morning when I went to uh, milk the cows, I was halfway there when there was this big tin column that came along and I, oh my gosh, here they're back again, you know, this is terrible. Um, but this thing popped up on top and there was a cheerful voice that looked at me and said, hey girl, can you tell us where the mayor's office is? <laughs> <laughs> And I started to try to explain it to him, and he said, hop on the tank, you will take your bike. And, <laughs> and I rode the tank into town, showed him where the mayor's office is. This was at five o'clock in the morning. And I ran home, and I warned my parents, my father and mother, that we were liberated. You know, the, the desert rats were here. That's what they told me they were. And um, they climbed out of bed, and we're in the street with a bottle of wine, and we, we woke up all the neighbors and said, hey, the, the desert rats are here. We are liberated. And everybody was dancing in the street, except for our next-door neighbors, because that was the head of the Nazi party in town. <laughs> <laughs> and they locked him up underneath the tower, and he complained about rats being there, and they told him, that's good company for you. <laughs> I will speak loudly into the microphone. I had the good fortune to live in the Netherlands in Zutlimberg um, at the um, in the late 60s, 70s, yeah. and I also am from Ottawa, Canada. Uh -huh. And the story was told to me that when the Queen and the royal family left the Netherlands, they went to England and that wasn't safe for them there. No, and then they went on to Canada. Except for the Queen. Except for the Queen. Well, somebody had a baby in... Oh yeah, that's Juliana. Juliana. And she happened to be born in the same hospital I was. Oh, wow! <laughs> Except my dad told me I was born in the turret. <laughs> so, but the story goes that in gratefulness to Juliana being born, was she born in, in Ottawa? No, Juliana was the mother. Juliana, well, Juliana's daughter yeah. um, was born in Ottawa. And mm -hmm. it is for that reason that every year the Netherlands sends, and I say Ashtabli from Dankuvel, um, to the Netherlands for millions and millions of tulips coming to Ottawa for the uh, tulip festival. <laughs> and so, Dankeschön. No, Ashtabli. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when the war started in 1940, I was 10. When it was over with, I was 15. And my father had surgery at the end, uh, after, the, after the war, and got pneumonia. They didn't have any antibiotics yet. Um, he was dying. An American surgeon came in, saw what was happening to him, and came and gave him his penicillin shots twice a day. Saved his life. We're very, very grateful to to, but we don't know who he is, because it was um, it was a um, thing that you weren't allowed to do for the army. You could get court-martialed for that at the time, because it was a secret. Is there any more questions? Yeah. And what brought you to the United States? 
Well, I was one of six lucky people that got uh, the first six, well, one of the first six scholarships that were offered here to come study in the United States. And um, when I had gone, finished the lycée, the director called me in and said, I want you to apply for one of these six because I think you can do it. And he had another student whose father died actually in the concentration camp. And he told her the same thing. Both of us were two of the six uh, in this one school. It was really uh, a surprise. <laughs> and um, so my mother made Oh, she made clothes for me, and she got everything ready. And the day before the boat went, uh, they, she was in a bicycle wreck. Uh, two bicycles ran into each other, and she sprained her ankle so bad she couldn't come to Rotterdam to see me off. <laughs> but it was a student boat with 1,500 students on board and a crew. Uh, all English except for about 10 of us or so. It was a very exciting trip. <laughs> Very much fun. I'd never seen so many men before. <laughs> I was wondering if there were uh, you witnessed any reprisals that the Germans did for activities by the underground. Excuse me. Were, were there any reprisals from the Germans for the Dutch underground activities? Oh, that happened all the time. Um, what he's asking is about the reprisals for underground activities. Yes, there were. Um, there, if some German was killed and it looked like it was deliberate, um, then there would be five or six people just picked up from the street and shot. However, uh, the Netherlands is a place where you can get away with it in some cases because it is such a wet land and there are so many canals in the big cities so when you see a drunken soldier at night and you give him a shove <laughs> into the canal, they're certain to drown and then you tell the authorities the next day, oh, you mean a Dutchman did that? The guy was drunk and he couldn't Tell the difference between the street and the canal. That's his problem, not ours, you know. <laughs> and, and so um, quite a few of them got drunk, drowned in canals and ditches and whatever. Um, and I had one of the best uh, compliments that I ever had. When I came here, there was an ex-German soldier in that school. And he told me, I've been in every country in Europe during the war. And I've never been treated so badly as in the Netherlands. And I said, <laughs> I said, thank you for the compliment. And he never understood. <laughs> wow, this has been an astonishing, amazing evening. I mean, every one of the panelists, I'm sure, could go on and on and to have that first person insight into these moments that you read about is really, I think we've all been very privileged to hear this. So thank, thank all of the panelists so much and, and congratulations for being here. So.